Hi everybody, welcome to the second edition of Scientific Image, um, where we're reading a bit of socialist science fiction in the second It still edition. says off air. For me. Oh, mine says live. Oh, I am so sorry. Oh, there it is. It turned for me too. I am so sorry. Ignore me. Blooper. Um, so, in the first session we looked at a lot of short fiction um, from a really wide range of sources and our conversation centered a lot on these qu on questions of the relationship between charisma and bureaucracy or administration and leadership. Um, the relationship between heroism and science was a um, topic of discussion and we also were able to bring the discussion towards a kind of a more general notion of science fiction that focused on reasoning or intelligence as the um, uh, central theme rather than technology. Um, in this from the readings that we assigned today, uh, there were three texts that were available. Um, Stanislav Lem's Futurological Congress, um, Evgeny Zamyatin's uh, We, and uh, the Strugatsky Brothers' Roadside Picnic. Um, Zamyatin's We is by far the earliest of them, written in the 1920s. Um, and then both We and uh, um, the Futurological Congress. Let me see when the date on that is. I believe it's this early uh, 60s or the late 50s. Oh no, it's 1971. And then the Strugatsky Brothers book is 1968. So these books, um, I, I hope all of you got to at least one of them or, or saw a movie version of it or read a review of it or something like that. Um, so we can have a conversation about it. But all three of these books are markedly different from the uh, um, from the readings that we looked at the first time because, <clears throat> I mean, for one thing, they have a much stronger dystopian flavor, all three of them, um, than some of the texts, which were some of the short stories we read, which were a little bit more utopian. Um, <clears throat> and we can talk a little bit about that as well as we go into it. Um, I'm going to, for this reading group, this session, I want to turn over the um, discussion, the presentations of the individual books to uh, different participants. Um, Phil has kindly um, mentioned that he's interested in talking about Roadside Picnic, which will be great. Um, Ted Craig will be able to talk a little bit about Stalker, which I think Phil will also talk about. Um, Quinn is going to talk a little bit about Stanislav Lem's Futurological Congress, and we might ask him to go first because he has to leave early. And then um, if there's someone, is there anyone here who read about, who read We by Zamyatin? No? Okay. Well, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that at the end. So, um, Quinn has to leave first, so maybe you can start with talking a little bit about the Futurological Congress, which I know Lizzie also read. So, Lizzie, maybe you can have first response um, to that. Oh, I, I hope my audio is fine. Yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting, feed, feed, I'm getting, getting feedback. feedback. So, some of you could turn your mics off. Um, I'm on mobile, so I can't mute people. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so the future future of World Congress. Uh, thank, thank you, David. Uh, it's it's quite something. It's um it's in the near future. Can we call it that? Um, and the population of the planet is about thirty billion, and there's uh you know, a group of futurologists um, that meet in Costa Rica at a hotel, at a convention center, um, I guess to discuss the future. And they get disrupted by protests, which is, which is great. Um, you know, I think if, if we were to have this kind of thing, like, like imagine like a supercharged UN that actually works, I suppose, um, it would you know, it'd still be on, like, the tired, like, Jeffersonian model of, like, of, of governance where there's a, there's a group that, you know, would, would draft a constitution and ratify it or, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, so, naturally, it gets disrupted by protests. Um, and Ian Tishi, uh, Lem's go-to uh, character for hijinks and everything, is uh, caught up. He's one of the representatives. Um, he gets caught up in the protest. There's a bombing. Um, 
but it's really it's really fun. Everything is funny, and this is like the the point. Um, I think of it. I, I just remember remember some scenes in, in Gravity's Rainbow, um, and it's also the way I, I've always watched Monty Python's Meaning of Life, where um, an institution is inherently like a mess, I suppose. Um, and I don't know if that's what them is going for, but it, it's an institution is funny because it's such a failure, I suppose. But it's it doesn't have to be failing really for the the miscommunication that goes on and the, the habits, um, I guess, to, to turn out to turn out funny. Um, I really think that the world population at that point, I, I guess, because I guess what Lem is what Lem is going at is is it is an absurd idea to think of you know global or transnational political organization the way we think of it now, and if we continue to think of that to like a complete you know expanded global transnationalized uh, scope it's gonna be ridiculous um, it's gonna be a shit show and I suppose I suppose that would be what he, where, where he thinks yeah so yep. if, I could, if I could just interrupt for a second um, the way the future logical Congress works is it's sort of a um, it's sort of a standard sci-fi plot because it's a kind of Malthusian plot, right? So the world gets overpopulated. There's going to be way too much. There's going to be way too many people. There's no way that we're going to be able to feed everyone, and so people are going to live in this kind of almost this kind of sense of post-crisis constantly. Um, and Lem also, in his version of this future, every it's unclear. Everyone's heavily medicated, so it's unclear whether people are experiencing a sort of the reality, so you have kind of that basic matrix question, that matrix variation on the on the Malthusian endpoint. Um, and the, what makes his discussion different, interesting is that he's kind of a slapstick writer. Like, everything that happens is absolutely ridiculous. So, for example, it's important that everyone's on drugged, so they think they're taking fancy elevators everywhere they go, or they think they're driving, but actually what they're doing is they're running and they're climbing up old elevator cables. So like they're constantly uh, um, they're constantly puffing uh, huffing and puffing because they're like basically hyperventilating and uh, many of them die of cardiac arrest and these are things that kind of get covered by the by the drugs that people are sort of medicated on um, so it, it's kind of a twist on that standard narrative um, uh, from a, a kind of humorous perspective where the ultimate kind of point of the humor might be something like like you can't tell, like you can't really, res like the you can't really resolve the matrix dilemma, red pill or blue blue pill, but it's kind of a joke anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. You said it. You said it so much better uh, than, than I could. Um, the, the the hallucination element um, is is quite amazing as it relates to institutionality because. It gets to a point where the doctor says he has a rare condition of thinking he's hallucinating. So, or no, of thinking he's not hallucinating. That was it. So instead of pathologizing the belief that, you know, reality isn't real, the belief that reality is a hallucination, instead of pathologizing that, the institution pathologizes the belief that you're not hallucinating because hallucination had become normal. Um, and that I also think is a brilliant point about institutions and about about governments. And it also serves as a satire of the attempt to predict the kind of sci-fi obsession with predicting the future. Because what happens is every time you try to predict the future, you end up I in this ridiculous passive position of being like kind of beaten up by hippies, and then you're arrested, and all sorts of things happen to you as soon as you try to predict. Um, the future. So, and the basic setting of, of it, by the way, is the Hilton in Costa Rica in 2050. So it is really also a spoof on, like, kind of um, um, parliamentary style. 
Uh, Lizzie, did you have anything you wanted to add to this discussion of, of the Futurological Congress? Any f immediate reactions, any thoughts? How did it strike you? Uh, we can't hear you. Oh, that's right. That's right. Now I remember. Um, would you like to maybe type your thoughts in little bite-sized increments so it feels conversational? Oh, I hear you. I hear you. No. No, that's that might be that might be Samir actually. So Sam, Sam, just so you're on um, up to speed. Um, Lizzie is talking a bit about the Futurological Congress by Stanislav Lem, um, and her microphone doesn't work, so we're gonna open group chat, and she's gonna type in little sent like little um, chunks so that it feels, <laughs> yeah, more conversational. Is that cool, Lizzie? Sorry, I have to go. I'll catch up with you all later. Bye, Quinn. Thank you, this is awesome. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, so, so we were, um, Sam, Samir, did you um, read We? Is that right? By Sam Yatin. And you didn't get to Stanislav Lem's Futurological Congress, or, right, you're only supposed to read one. Great, super. Do um, you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Cool, yeah. You want to maybe introduce yourself? And then also, I'm sorry, but um, Seth, I, I meant to ask you to introduce yourself as well. So maybe Samir, introduce yourself first, and then after that, Seth can. Yeah, well, my name is Samir. I'm in Perpignan, southern, south of France in the moment. And I'm uh, writing a PhD thesis on the contemporary novel realism, phenomenology, and stuff. So, is that enough? <laughs> I don't know. Seth? Hi, everybody. Um, my name's Seth. Uh, I was invited to this by Quinn. I saw one of his uh, performances not too long ago. And, uh, He's been a friend of mine and a friend of friends. So uh, I just graduated from Penn and I studied philosophy and cognitive science. So now I'm just kind of uh, studying on my own and uh, glad to have found out about the new center because there's a lot of cool stuff. So it's good to be with everybody. So I was saying. Um we're first talking about the Futurological Congress, and then we're going to talk a little bit about roads, Roadside Picnic. And then after that, we're going to talk um, at the end about uh, We. Um, and all three of these novels are very different from the f short fiction from the first one, because they're, they all are what we are arguably dystopian, whereas the first session was sort of selected with an eye towards more utopian texts, with um, drawing on the sort of the contention that uh, Jameson uh, makes, and also Raymond Williams in a very similar tone um, in their discussions of utopian science fiction where they argue that <clears throat> um, capitalist contexts produce dystopian novels and uh, socialist contexts produce utopian novels. Um, that's kind of the very simplified version. And, and what they're both interested in the end is in a materialist novel. Um, so I, I wanted us to talk a little about the particular quality of the dystopian novel here, um, this, the very idea, this kind of basic science fictional idea of projecting into the future and predicting it, um, <clears throat> and whether or not, and, and then the, some of the reservations these novels have about that, <clears throat> and then also um, talk also about that implicit comparison that's kind of inevitable when you do the socialist science fiction reading group. I mean, there was, I don't know if you saw it some here, but there's an interesting review by George Orwell of mm -hmm. uh, we, which is basically a comparison of we to Brave New World. So it's like a triangulation of like your cla your three classic um, dystopian sci-fi texts. Um, <clears throat> and then Lem is very special because he does the he does the usual thing, but he does it in a slapstick manner. 
Um, so it's it's it has a very different effect. It's like a cross of Douglas Adams and Brave New World. Right. Yeah. So Lizzie says, uh, um, and I'm reading this because the the text box doesn't go onto the YouTube recording. Uh, just wanted to say that I noted some parallel themes with this Lem novella and the last short story we looked at, which was Stanislav Lem's The Seventh Voyage. The themes are taken to a different level, especially the battle of minds, I think, the drug versus reality issue, and then battles of good and evil within, and this question of different selves. Um, yeah, I think that the question of different selves is also important for Stanislav Lem because he is by far the most consistently ironical of sci-fi authors that we're going to deal with. Um, and uh, his interest in ironization is actually also related to his interest in general paradoxes. So you don't know for sure if he's serious or if he's joking. You also don't know if what's happening on the page is real or a hallucination. And that kind of way of deferring things, I think, is also closely related to his particular context. I mean, I don't know Polish literature very well, but the at least in Polish art, um, sort of from the 80s onwards, this kind of strategy of ionization or parody it becomes very important as a way to reflect on the conditions of expression in a kind of like a quasi-Soviet or like a, a quasi-Soviet state. Um, uh, it is it very is prevalent in Polish literature. We told Gombrowicz, Ferdy Durka, and, and Stanislaw Witkiewicz, there's a long tradition of irony and, and uh, social satire in Poland. So I think maybe we can, in the interest of time, maybe we can start talking a little bit about Roadside Picnic as well. Philip, if you want to take the lead on that, um, and then Ted can supplement. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll give him a lead into the movie. Uh, uh, how many people have read the book? Just curious. I started, but I didn't finish. OK. And how many people have seen the movie? OK, good. So I'll give a plot summary then. To some degree, or uh, the situation, which is novel. It, there's been an alien visit 13 years before the book. Uh, it's not quite clear what happened, but what they've left behind uh, are, certain, are certain aspects of themselves or their uh, pro possibly even their garbage, which has created a zone that's totally distinct from everything in the real world and starts having effects on the real world. Uh, the objects in that zone uh, become attractive both for scientific study, uh, people want to get them and see what they do to understand something about the aliens, but also because uh, uh, they become uh, sought after for sale. Uh, some of them seem to have good properties, some of them uh, have horrible effects of mutations and whatever. Uh, and, and nobody knows what will happen when they go in there, so it's a, a, a quite a curious place. Uh, I wanted to talk about four aspects of this. Uh, the way uh, 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 Althusser has a phrase, we know capital by its effects, and uh, I think uh, uh, um, the Strugazis are wonderful at creating the zone by showing its effects rather than describing it directly. I want to talk a little bit about the geography of the zone and the town around it, because that's totally different from in the movie, and I think has to do with the, the ultimately different uh, 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 meaning, if I can bring such discredited term into uh, uh, discourse again, uh, of, the two, uh, of the two works, both of which are, are, are wonderful. Uh, and I want to talk about uh, the main character, who's called Red, uh, who's a stalker. A stalker is a person who goes into the zone uh, and, or, and, and brings back some of the swag and then tries to sell it. Uh, and I think in the, the uh, Tarkovsky movie, uh, he's a, a, a spiritual quester, uh, whereas in the uh, book, you could say he's a worker under capitalism. Uh, and I want to talk also about the cosmic view of the book as opposed to the movie. So uh, the, the story is divided in, in 
essentially four chapters with a, a prologue. The prologue gives us a uh, interview with a scientist uh, who's just got a Nobel Prize for studying the zone, where we pick up a few things, uh, uh, and, and the the uh, uh, line becomes: the scientist says, "What's important is is the fact of the visit." And the news people are always asking about what kind of technological toys can you get out of it. So there's a, already a, a kind of gulf that's set up there. Uh, and, and then in the four chapters, uh, two of them are trips into the zone, the first and the fourth. The second one, we meet the stalker when he's coming out of the zone, but we, we learn a lot about the zone as he's coming out. And the third is a discussion between a businessman and a scientist, uh, told from, from another point of view, the businessman's, as to what, what the meaning of the visit was and so forth. Uh, so uh, if you look at the, what happens in the first section is uh, the stalker is working at a uh, scientific institute. Uh, uh, he's been in jail before, but now he's going straight, and supposedly it's illegal to go in the zone. There are checkpoints and cops. Uh, and he, 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 he baits one of the scientists, saying, you know, you're holding one of these objects called an empty, which are two disks. Uh, which there's a space between them, but they seem to hang together, and you're just looking at empty space, and no one knows what they are, and they're studying them. And he says, well, you know, those are empties, but have you ever, ever seen a full one? And the scientist says, a full disk? What, there are them? And uh, so the scientist says, you know, take me into the zone, and I'll get, uh, uh, I'll get the papers that we need, and we can go in a hovercraft, which is called a hover boot, and... Uh, uh, we'll take one person along. So we have a simple trip into the zone, which is legal. Uh, and, and yet in this simple trip, we, we realize what a frightening place it is. Uh, the, the descriptions of uh, what, what happens in the zone, there's an offhand reference to something like, uh, uh, you know, there'll be a line like, uh, 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 you know, uh, if you look at this place at night, you see all these lights, the, the hell slime is on, uh, uh, or a, a description of that's where so-and-so died and here's what happened to him. So already we're, we're picking up details about the place, uh, and we get to uh, uh, um, this description, which I think is wonderful. Uh, um, but now, I should say, it's like an industrial landscape, which is very important. It's an abandoned industrial landscape. There are excavators and tractors, there are garages and so forth. You know, but they're just little things that are different, and, and, and here's one of them. Uh, uh, only the T, TV antennas give the place away. They're overgrown with wispy hairs. Our eggheads have long been hankering after these antennas. They'd like to know, you see, what this hair is. We don't have it anywhere else, only in the plate quarter and only on the antennas. Uh, last year they got an idea, lowered an anchor from a helicopter and hooked a clump of hair. They gave it a pull, suddenly, pssst, we looked down and saw that the antenna was smoking, the anchor was smoking, even the cable itself was smoking, and not just smoking, but hissing poisonously like a rattlesnake. Well, the pilot, never mind that he was a lieutenant, quickly figured out what, what's what, dumped the cable and hightailed it out of there. There it is, their cable, hanging down almost to the ground and covered with hair. So there's this cable that's left there that's just covered with hair. It's a kind of surrealist painting image, but it's things like that that give uh, the zone its, uh, 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 its, its uh, identity. And, and um, the next thing they notice is there's a little tremor in the air that just passes by. And, and the stalker basically approaches going through, when they, through the... the, the uh, zone in like one of those World War II movies when people are walking through a mine, minefield step by step. You have to uh, throw something ahead of you. In this case, it's a nut to see how it reacts with the air. And if it looks good, then you go to where that nut is and, and keep going to the next one. Uh, and then it, that way they discover that there's something called a bug trap there that they have to go around. So they're doing all this very careful stuff, and, and they get to this garage where the full empty is. And the stalker notices in there there's a, uh, a little silver sparkle in the air, uh, and it looks odd to him. And as they go in, and he 
they get to the place and they're getting the empty, the, the scientist that's with him unwittingly turns his back and the little silver sparkle comes on his back uh, for a second and goes. And the stalker feels this moment of intense dread and, and said, did you feel anything? Are you okay? And the guy says, what? What? And he says, okay, I better not just uh, 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 upset him. So they go out, they get the empty, everything is, seems to be very good. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, they're joking, they take showers, they, the press comes in and, and asks what they found, and they're being interviewed, you know, there's a, there, there's a news media around. The stalker goes out to a bar uh, to have a drink, uh, and then when he's at the bar, which is called the Borscht, it's a dive bar, uh, he hears the news on the phone that this Russian scientist who took him in his own has died, just suddenly had a heart attack when he had a shower. So that's how we learn the effect of the zone. That's the end of the first second. And then this guy gets drunk and has a, uh, gets in a bar brawl. So that leads naturally to the geography of this. Now, one of the interesting things about this rather than the movie is it's set in three time periods. So we can see the evolution of the town. And basically what you see is the evolution of uh, this site into a kind of capitalist boom down in the Klondike. In the beginning, it's just a uh, uh, it, it, it's just uh, uh, the the town, uh, the scientific institute, a lot of police and military cordoning it off, and some of the residents who stayed around who don't want to leave, and a few people coming out of curiosity. Uh, but gradually, when the when the swag that they get that comes out of the zone. Uh, starts to seem to have scientific and economic possibilities, suddenly it becomes a huge, uh, uh, a large number of people flock to this place, which by the way is called Harmont and seems to be located somewhere in the northern U.S. or in Canada. Um, um, the, uh, uh, let me just read you a, a quick description of what the... Bill, this, this is a great, great summary, by, by the way. Thank you for... Thank you for, for um, right, um, let me cut it down, because I maybe I'm going too long. I won't yeah. read the things. Yeah, but anyway, to, to get to the... So anyway, it becomes a boon town. There's a plush... Uh, the, the things are, there's a place called the Metropole. There are hotels, there are doormen, there are liver, livery doormen, and so forth. And at the same time, there seems to be poverty at the edge of town, too. Uh, all sorts of people come uh, thinking they're going to get rich. Uh, they don't. They end up working as whores. They work as doormen. Uh, they try to become stalkers and die. You know, it's essentially, uh, uh, we presented with a situation where uh, essentially only a few people will get rich here, and the rest are going to come lured by the idea of witches, of riches. Uh, and what we see with this Red, who in, in the Star, uh, Tarkovsky movie is a spiritual uh, guide who takes a writer and a professor in the zone, which to him is a holy place that he goes to visit as a kind of spiritual, uh, a, a, a spiritual station of the cross. Uh, he, he even at one point has a vision of the book of Revelation in there, and he's quite close to Jesus. Uh, the guy in the book... Uh, speaks in kind of American hard-boiled. Uh, he's a guy who since goes in there for money, basically. He notices some odd things and has kind of moments, but he's, he's there, he, he's driven in there to get the swag again. And in the last uh, chapter when he goes in, he's going after something that's called the Golden Sphere, which is supposed to grant every wish uh, that you want. Uh, and... Uh, when there's a, uh, we finally get to it, he goes in there with a, a, a stalker, uh, a, a young guy who wants to be a stalker, and uh, they get to the sphere, and, and the, the, the description of how they go through the sphere, the kind of uh, uh, forces that are unleashed almost feel like they're working in a blast furnace. And, and there's something about that. There's an excavator around. There's all this industrial material. You get a hellish image of what work is like, even as they're going through it. And for, for the stalker, it's work to just get this thing. And uh, there's a line about why do we need money if all we need to do is keep working there. That seems to be the 
what's driving this thing. And the golden sphere, uh, when they get to it, uh, seems to, uh, there's nothing about it to disappoint, but there was nothing to inspire hope. And the hope that he has uh, that is happiness for everyone for free, as opposed to going after these things that have use value and exchange value. So I think if you read through that section, you'll see that, uh, that uh, it's this utopian impulse that the guy feels the world has to change. What we're doing here is horrible going after these things. I am compelled to do. Uh, so I read it that way. Uh, so, I mean, I could substantiate that by going through some of the uh, uh, reading passages, but we don't have time to do that. And I, I would say that the movie is... Is, is wonderful for a different reason. The movie is wonderful because of the way it creates the zone uh, by purely visual rather than special effect means, long takes, and gives a sense of eeriness in stillness in these things. Uh, but it's staging essentially a totally different story, which is uh, something you might find in a Dostoevsky novel in the 19th century. Uh, where there would be three figures, who, like in the Karamazovs, who each represent different things, uh, talking about spirituality or intellect or so forth. One of them is a scientist, an empiricist. The other one is a writer who can't write any more, is looking for inspiration. And the other is the stalker, who's a kind of simple guy, who's close to this religious truth of the zone. And, and, and they engage in these dialogues all the way through. Um, but it is a totally different... Uh, use of the zone. So again, what it creates is this marvelous sense of the zone which lingers with you uh, afterwards uh, that's totally different, uh, but uses it to different purposes. Uh, if uh, there, there is a distinction in the 19th century in Russian literature between what's called the westernizers and the Slavophiles. The Slavophiles, Dostoevsky was one, who are kind of rediscovering Russia through religion and so forth, and Slava, uh, the westernizers close to the West and the Enlightenment. The Strugatsky brothers are Enlightenment uh, people, essentially good communists who believe in a utopian future and want it to happen and portray, I think, this... Uh, uh, they didn't start out to describe it this way, but they endow the, the, the desire to bring these objects back with the kind of need of, of uh, somehow surviving and doing terrible things to survive. So I'll stop there. Ted, maybe you can build on his description of the difference between the novel and the Tarkovsky movie, which I think is really kind of a fascinating difference, the transformation of this main character. Yeah, sure. I, I did not finish the book, um, but I can sort of just give a quick overview of the, how the film develops, if that's helpful. Um, so yeah, it takes place in sort of an unnamed country that is heavily policed, and the zone is this, uh, it's sort of this, it, it even has color transition. The first industrial, like, place that the main character, the stalker, wakes up in, in his bed, and he lives with his, uh, the mother of his child and his child, and um, he starts to prepare to go into the zone. And as he's he meets up with the scientist and the writer character um, at a bar, and then they proceed to like hop in a topless jeep and like evade like being shot at by um, patrol. So then they break through the, like, gated barricades around the zone, and then it transitions into color. Um, and the zone is, like, this luscious, like, vast sort of empty green minefield-like place. Um, and he's guiding these two characters through um, throwing these the ribbons ahead of him as he goes to make sure that it's safe. Um, and I think the, they're headed towards this place called The Room. That's the only way that they've described it. And supposedly, um, The Room is sort of mysterious, but it seems like it, it may like grant your uh, deepest desires once you're there. Um, 
and they they have scenes where they're like drawing straws to see who has to go first down a tunnel because the tunnel seems dangerous. Um, and then they get to the room, and the climax scene, I, I didn't really understand. I just watched it yesterday. Um, and I wonder if Philip would want to talk a little bit more about that. But the scene, the scientist receives a phone call inside of this this room, and it seems that he's talking with another scientist at an institute that he works at. Um, and then there's like uh, there's a technological element that happens. I wonder if Philip can hop in here. Oh, uh, I I haven't seen. I I managed to see the first two hours, uh, but not the whole thing again. I saw it, I've seen it twice before, so I don't quite remember the climax. I do remember the phone being kind of odd and that they're going to a room instead of looking for the golden sphere. Uh, but I think, uh, so I can't help you there, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, maybe I'll paraphrase it as best I can. I'm not sure that I fully understood what happened, but it seemed as if the scientist was carrying a bomb to, the, to bring to the room, and... Uh, the phone call he gets from perhaps another like rival colleague was uh, one the colleague says that he slept with his wife and then he accuses him of something else and then he he seems like he's uh, distraught and he proceeds to set the bomb up to uh, go off and I think his intent is to destroy the room, um, at which point the stalker, who's sort of the spiritual guru character, um, starts wrestling with him to try to um, stop him from doing this. And the writer character um, steps in and he starts pushing the stalker into the water and the, there's these weird uh, moments where the scientist is setting up the bomb, the writer is beating up the stalker, and the scientist is saying, like, whoa, 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 you're so uncivilized, like, don't, don't hit him, but doing nothing while setting up the bomb. And then the, um, they, there's, like, tense dialogue about, uh, if they destroy this place, they're destroying hope. I think that's what is said. And then um, eventually they all just sort of sit down in this uh, in this room, and then the scientist dismantles the bomb and throws it into just like puddles in the corners of the room. Then um, wait, I. I um... I, I don't want us to do a summary of the entire movie, but maybe just focus on a few of the differences. Um, and I was thinking, maybe you could respond to um, Phil's interpretation of the book and see if it fits with the movie or what changed with the Tarkovsky vision. Because the uh, Phil interpreted the book as a kind of, um, if I understood this right, correct me if I'm wrong, but you interpreted it as a, a, a kind of uh, sort of critique of capitalism in the form of a science fiction allegory which focuses on how these technological artifacts um, transition from being sort of mysterious and magical towards being used and commodified with an emphasis on um, with an emphasis on oh wait I, I almost had it um, Oh, and that the, the these artifacts sort of end up producing a gold rush, um, and that I, I think that last words. And I'd be curious how the movie ends at the very end, Ted. But the very last words of the book are like, "I hope that everything." It's like he gets one wish, and he says something like, "I hope that happiness is free," instead of saying like, "I hope that everyone's happy," which is a very weird way of putting it, right? Like why? Like, well, who, like, wouldn't you just wish that everyone's happy instead of wishing that nobody had to pay for happiness? 
So I, I'm kind of curious if some of those themes make it into the film, which seems to be a little bit more kind of ha have more of a mystical tone and less of a kind of grungy post-industrial feeling. Yeah, can I quick just, I'll just quick yeah. describe the last scene, if that's all right, um, mm -hmm. for plot spoilers. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Um, so uh, he ends up leaving the zone with the scientist and the writer, going home, and his and the stalker's plan is then, well, maybe I will bring my wife and my child there um, to live in the zone. And he like breaks down on his bed and he's crying and his wife is like drying his tears and he's saying they just don't understand what this place is and um, he, he's, he has this huge disappointment that no one understands this place. Um, and then he, the wife says, well, what if I come with you? And he, and he says, well, what if you, what if you don't understand it either? <laughs> And then, um, and then it ends on this really weird note where it switches to his daughter who's sitting in the kitchen reading a black leather bound book and then she starts telekinetically moving objects on the table and then the objects start to be rattled by a train that's coming by in the distance. So that's the, that was the end of the movie. I'm curious uh, about Soviet reception towards the movie. Um, but the differences, I, it wasn't clear to me the place that they existed in. Um, it was an industrial city, and it was heavily policed. Um, yeah. Well, let me, uh, two things there. I, I mean, just to go back to what David was saying. Here is the ending of the book. I mean, just the, the, on the last two pages... Uh, one of the guys yells, happiness for everyone, free, as much happiness as you want, everyone gather round, plenty for everyone, no one will be forgotten, free, happiness, free, okay? And then on the next page, as he's crawling on, the stalker thinks, how do I stop being a stalker when I have a family to feed, get a job, and I don't want to work for you, your work makes me want to puke, you understand? If a man has a job, then he's always working for someone else. He's a slave, nothing more. And I've always wanted to be my own boss, my own man, so that I don't have to give a damn about anyone else. Uh, happiness free for everyone and let no one be forgotten is on the last page. So all right, that's clear in one direction. The part I left out, which is, uh, is that the other dimension is, of course, the aliens have come, and for, this is the most important thing that has ever happened. But it's got, it kind of gotten lost in some of the human concerns. And, and in a discussion in the middle, uh, when they're trying to decide what, the, what, what this visit meant, uh, he develops this roadside picnic image. He says, imagine a forest, a country road, a meadow. A car pulls off the road into the meadow and, lo and unloads young men, bottles, picnic baskets, girls, transistor radios, cameras. A fire is lit, their tents, music, in the morning they leave, the animals and birds look and they've left, uh, see they've left an oil spill, a gasoline puddle, old spark plugs and oil filters strewn about. Uh, someone's dropped a monkey wrench, the wheels have tracked mud, etc. And of course, the remains of a campfire, apple cores, candy wrappers, tins, bottles, someone's handkerchief, blah, blah, blah. And he said, what the aliens did is they had a roadside picnic. They didn't even notice the human beings, and now we're, everybody's rummaging around the garbage. So cosmically, this is a different universe than the one that that uh, the kind of god godly universe that the, the sacred place that the stalker is finding in this room and so forth, where he wants to take his wife back to live there because, in a certain way, he feels closer to. Uh, uh, is, it feels closer to something sacred. So I think, you know, it's absolutely different what it's used for. And I don't know if the, these excerpts make it clear. Yeah, I, I'm interested in that too. It also, I think there's a room to read it as uh, much more pessimistic, the film at least, because it leaves every player feeling incredibly isolated from each other. Um, 
like the stalker is unwilling to bring his family there because he's afraid they won't understand it, and then he would uh, feel even more alienated from them. One of the things that can be helpful now, especially since we're all reading different things, is do you have uh, questions that Ted and uh, Phil's presentations brought up in you, like questions that would help you learn more? Like what are you curious about plot-wise or character-wise or language-wise about what happened? Can I hop in and ask Phil one more question? Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you know anything about the how the book was received when it was first released. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, description by the authors on the back describing their problems with Soviet censorship in, in those days and and it turned out that even though uh, there is the book isn't as subversive towards Soviet reality as hard to be a god this other book that they wrote which essentially uh, in some ways shows the action of uh, intellectuals under Stalinism and and, and Beria uh, by this time the Soviet the, the bureaucracy has grown to such a degree, sort of like a Hollywood studio, uh, interfering with every line in a movie and revising it for reasons that just because they can. He describes this process where they keep getting back things uh, that said this is bad language here, this is, you know, all sorts of, that has nothing political whatsoever, but is, you know, almost like uh, 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 a, a kind of... Uh, the state of Georgia or something interfering with the William Burroughs book or you know and so it's it's uh, uh, it was never published except in an expurgated form and then later after the the uh, uh, 1989 it came out again uh, but this time in, in in the way it was written so it, it's uh, they're very funny it, it was you know it, it, it it doesn't seem that there was anything really objectionable about the book from a communist vision, but it was more in those cases that people who were above you were just picking apart what you did because they could. I think that um, that particular structure of, of um the, the desire for that, that gold rush mentality of a desire could be something that we could, that if we had more time we could talk more about. I know there's a very interesting definition or discussion of conceptual art in um, Moscow compared to New York that I know of where they emphasize that what conceptual art did in the American context was that it made, um, it emphasized the materiality of an object, the pure simple materiality without any conceptual baggage because what capitalism had done to these objects was to make was to make them fetishes, right? To have kind of um, an unfulfillable desire attached to every object. And so it was a radical move to simply emphasize the sufficiency, the material sufficiency of the object. And then Keti Chukrov in her description of Moscow conceptualism emphasized how these objects, how a chair was already a concept was a conceptual object in its materiality, so that like all chairs looked kind of shitty because they were fulfilled because they kind of existed in an ideal form, which <laughs> and, and as opposed to like a um, as opposed to a capitalist chair, and she actually talks about chairs where and chairs are actually important in the history of conceptual art, but she says that in the capitalist context, a chair is highly is extremely marketed because it always has a lack; it's never fully fulfilled. Um, so that kind of uh, the difference in a structure of desire about um, uh, I mean, I mean, I think that could be a rubric towards understanding how roadside picnic works um, and how these artifacts that are left behind work. I think the, I, I guess I didn't really understand that the roadside picnic refers to the fact that these 
incredible technological artifacts could just be remainders. And that scale shift is, is also very interesting between, um, you know, humans being at the center of the narrative to become totally insignificant because they're just fighting it out over kind of morsels. Um, Samir, I was wondering if you had any thoughts that you wanted to share before moving maybe into a discussion of we? Not really. I mean, I would, of course, be interested in the language. I mean, this is not a real question, but like in the style uh, of the book, uh, who is the narrator, how is, uh, is, is it omniscient, is it very... Because, um, as uh, Theodore said, um, the film is very, in the film, everything is very sublimated and very implicit and very vague and very indeterminate. So how is that in the book? Um, the book, uh, the point of view uh, in the, the four main stories is the, the first two are from the point of view of the stalker, and uh, the last one from the point of view of the stalker, the third one is from the point of view of a businessman uh, who, who we meet earlier. Uh, we're getting the stalker's opinion of the zone and his history of the zone in terms of previous trips into it and what happened to the people who went in. Uh, the tone, again, uh, totally different uh, from the movie in, in terms of the tone of the, the narrator's tone of voice, uh, which is really American hard-boiled. Uh, at one point, uh, a wonderful scene where an immigration agent uh, catch it, comes up to him in the bar and is trying to persuade people to leave this place so the scientists can study it better and... Uh, uh, they wouldn't have all these people running over. They, they played this relocation fee, and, and he says to the stalker, no offense, but what's keeping you here? And, and this is the tone of the narration. Uh, he, I, he, right, I'll tell him what it really is. Uh, right, like I'll tell him what it really is. What a question, I say. Sweet childhood memories, my first kiss in the park, my mommy and daddy, the first time I got drunk in this very bar our police station, so dear to my heart. So he's basically, an Amer you know, he could be played by Robert Mitchum in, in, in this particular thing, which is totally different, again, than the movie, who, as I say, is a spiritual quester. And, and I think everybody in the movie is going in to resolve a particular life crisis of their own in the zone. Uh, the scientist is an empiricist, and the zone violates his notion of what what there ought to be in the world and what is in the world, which is perhaps is the reason why he wants to bomb it. The writer is somebody who uh, has reached a point where he can't write anymore. He's hoping to find his inspiration rekindled in the zone. And the, the, the stalker describes himself as having been taught stalking by a master, as if he was a, uh, a Zen acolyte who had followed this master and now he was going in this place, which there were certain things you have to do. Uh, and uh, so it, it really is uh, focused totally differently uh, from this guy who was just in there because uh, he, he's alive to the kind of spiritual elements of the zone. He, he once calls it, a, the stalker calls it a hold of the future. He, something in him likes to hang around there because this is going on, but it doesn't interfere with the fact that he's driven to keep going in there again and again uh, uh, because... Uh, He's got to survive somehow, and you know he he doesn't like having real jobs, and you know it, it, this is taking more of a risk. So, Samir, I was wondering, Samir, I was wondering a little bit about, little bit about uh, uh, Phil. You'll have Phil, to, you'll have to if you I, could, I, yeah. About I'm weed. sorry, I, did, I didn't get it. I, the, the connection was not very, very good. I was wondering and if you could um, talk a little bit about we then, and maybe focus on what you found interesting about it. Um, I know that you studied I, the novel much I more in depth. Prepare, than I didn't prepare a, um, a summary or something, so I, I think I can't do that uh, ad hoc. But but what I can, I mean, did anybody read it? I read it. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's weird. Yeah. So I, 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 will tr I will give a very brief summary from what I remember and then if there is something unclear you can ask more questions and I try to explain more. Um, 
So we are in a um, in a very strange um, state, which is called the United State. Uh, one thing um, I read it in German because I had two translations, and um, from what I felt reading the first pages, the German translation was a little bit better. So I started to read the German one. So if there is some um, terminological unclear, like some things that are not clear, you David, you can maybe give the better. So as I go, I will translate from German. So please correct me if there is something wrong. Um, so we are in this state, which is called the United States, and we have a narrator. The, the um, we don't know if if there's if it's humans who live there. It's uh, they call themselves numbers. Uh, the narrator is called D. Wait a sec, D five hundred three, I think. D being the first name, the number being the last name, and he is a mathematician and he's working on a machine or on a rocket that is called uh, the integral and this is going to as far as I understood to going to export um, the success story of this state into the cosmos is it right? did you get it? yeah um, and so if you if we were talking so far about uh, what did you say the happiness for everybody happiness for free so here you have also it's more a dictatorship of happiness so happiness is forced everybody has to be happy and how can you achieve happiness in or, uh, you ha you can achieve it uh, with eradicating everything that is uh, personal everything that is dreams fant fantasy uh, and so on so this mathematician has this dream that there will be a world without dreams, without desires, without uh, fantasy, uh, where everybody will be happy because only facts um, will um, exist, nothing else. And then, um, as the more uh, his narration goes, so we are reading his diary, if you want, and it's not very clear, um, at least for me, it was not very clear uh, who the address is because um, he, he talks to us as readers and he says, um, you may be very um, like people who haven't achieved that level of conscience, uh, consciousness we have achieved. Um, uh, you uh, um, won't understand some things that are very clear for us, so I will have to explain them. Blah blah blah. Um, um, but and at one point we could we we can have uh, the impression that he's talking to somebody to an addressee that will come. At another point, he says it's actually very weird to write a book to your ancestors. So he's writing to us as the as the ancestors, and his world being in a in in a in a distant future. And then it goes on. There are two uh, women. Uh, one is called E some I something. One is called O something. And he's kind of uh, he's oscill oscillating between them. Of course, there are no real personal relationships. They uh, they are uh, ab abonnements. I don't know how that is in in in, in English. Um, li liaison. Um, yeah. So you you kind of draw. Uh, it's like a lottery. You draw a number and then you are uh, you hook up with somebody and then you have some whatever. So um, but uh, there is. In all this um, flat universe of mathematical formulas, of lines, of geometrical figures, um, there is the constant menace of, uh, of the emergence of a soul. And the guy who narrates becomes ill, and uh, um, being sick means having a soul, having feelings, feeling love, uh, having doubts about uh, the United States, and so on and so on. Um, so let me just go to my thesis or what I find really interesting it's clearly a dystopian um, novel about totalitarianism it's uh, an, a novel that draws a very bleak image of what happens when um, reason in a very mathematical uh, enlightenment sense becomes um, the only parameter of uh, how we measure reality how we do politics how we organize our social life but at the same time um, uh, Samyatin uses a very, very beautiful language, um, drawing, like using, like creating metaphors and similes and la and beautiful language out of um, mathematics, out of technology, out of all these things 
that are su supposed to be bad if they are exaggerated. So my idea was that, or my question would be, how can you write a dystopian novel without falling back into a very bad or very shallow humanist critique, which would be, oh, if we uh, exaggerate mathematics, if we exaggerate technology, we will all end in this dystopian totalitarian state where everything is controlled, where everything is surveilled and so on, where contingency has no place. And um, so he shows it partly um, through, I mean, really um, making fun in a, in a bleak way about this, um, about this exaggeration of mathematics. So saying, telling us that mathematics is not everything and is not enough. But at the same time, I think we could also say um, he tells us that this guy is not only failing or this state is not only wrong because it, it is only based on mathematics, but I think it's also wrong because it's based on the wrong mathematics. It's based on a very classical notion of mathematics being... Um, um, mathematics that won't deal and can't deal with contingency, with openness, with um, whatever you want, unpredictability and all that. A very interesting thing is that he's always uh, um, bothered and embarrassed with um, fractal objects. For example, he's writing his diary and then he's revising it and then he says, oh, I found these spots in there. I, I, I hate spots. Um, you know, he finds it in his own manuscript. Or he hates uh, fog, he hates uh, clouds, everything that is fractal. So, um, which would be an object for a more contemporary mathematics. So, that was my idea about it. I think also, um, that, 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 that's a great presentation. My thought is that um, all of three's three novels, the way that they're dystopian, I think, has something to do with the dissatisfaction with the difference between communist ideals and how socialist states function, um, and in particular as a critique of bureaucracy, um, and uh, that the you know the way the bureau the bureaucracy is ultimately you know can be described as the mechanization of everything, as in we where everything is sort of quantified, or in Stanislav Lem it's not exactly described that way. It's actually described as um, kind of a more Kafka esque model, so it's not. The problem isn't necessarily um, quantification, but r the rigidity of power structures without any kind of justification for them. So, you know, someone tells you what to do just because they're above you, and then you just have to do it. Um, or in the case, and then in the case of the, the roadside picnic, that's actually quite a lot more different because it's not so much a critique of bureaucracy as it seems to be a critique of the market um, in the way that everyone is sort of trying to get ahead and trying to get something um, from the zone, um, or, or basically trying to exploit the zone. So I guess, I think that's quite interesting, this question of forms of uh, planning or administration that, or science, scientific practice that would be, uh, as you say, Samir, contemporary, right? So maybe not, um, that wouldn't fall into this modern problem of a dis you having a strict distinction between um, the humanities and the sciences, for example, between acting intuitively and, between, and acting procedurally. Um, that, that was my initial um, thought about your, your notes on we. What, is, what does everybody think? I, I, I'm personally very interested in administration, so maybe I'm getting a bit carried away. Well, it's very interesting that we was published in 1921, or was written in 21 and 22, and I think read before the Writers Union in 1923, uh, which is a time where there really is a great flowering of uh, Russian art and, uh, you know, constructivism, theater, and so forth, and a lot of openness um, uh, before certainly Stalin has uh, uh, introduced what we understand as a totalitarian state. So, uh, what does everybody think uh, uh, think of his? Uh, uh, is, is this prophetic, or does it? Ha is he is he developing some? Is he picking stuff that's up in the air at the time, or or is he not? Where where does this come from? This particular vision of uh, this totally mathematized state. 
at the time where people were still trying to figure out ways to uh, uh, Lenin at least in, in the 20s was uh, continually changing policy and trying to adjust and saying you know we're not a uh, uh, the problem is we're starting to have bureaucracy we're not a worker state so we need to and in the end he says uh, I think Stalin should be dismissed from being the first secretary you know so that there are a lot of people who are trying pragmatically to keep adjusting uh, their desire to create uh, in the beginning a, 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 a state that is uh, uh, is run by the vast majority who work rather than an oligarchy or, uh, and is it Zamyatin's idea that any attempt to do this is just doomed uh, to create this kind of rational horrible uh, bureaucratic state or uh, or what Well, just one thing. My impression is at least that this op this openness that you describe very well the, of the cultural um, atmosphere uh, is reflected in the book because it's very difficult to give an easy answer to what you just asked. Um, because again, as I say, I mean, um, for me, it reads as uh, as clearly against reductionism. Um, so it's against something humanist. It's against um, 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 we have to reactivate our human feelings, blah blah blah, our individualism and so on, um, in order to not being overwhelmed by the machines and so on. But it's also against um, reductionism on the other side. So it's a complex navigation through that tension space that opens up in that time, and. Um, I think also the narration that starts very e in a very easy or very clear way and uh, the guy who's constantly reminding himself that he has to only uh, talk about the facts and as he goes from within you have the fantasy popping up but always um, um, connected to the very subject matter he's talking about which is also mathematical formula and all that there are beautiful passages about love being a function of death um, um, and so on. And there is also a very beautiful, very interesting reflection that I think, if I remember right, comes from one of the women, uh, I think I, who says um, there is um, there are two forces in the world, energy and entropy. And it seems to be that the old people, the, the old uh, um, uh, humans, the old human beings, um, were praying to entropy and that the new um, people of the United States are praying, if they pray at all, to energy, um, if I remember right. But um, there is no, no clear, clear answer to this because in the moment she wants to finish the sentence there are three suspension points. And this is something he does all the time. He opens up uh, some you know, reflections, some philosophical things, and then very often the narration is just interrupted. So I read it as a reflection also of this openness. I'm not sure if that answered anything you asked, but... Um... I think also we can talk about how... I mean, it sort of has to do with the relationship between this question of science and fiction, right? Um, that fiction is often thought of as the open and science is thought of as the closed. Or this is like the very stereotyped um, problematic view, um, the reductionist one. And uh, that I I I'm excited. I'm always excited about the the novels that do do more to open our ideas of the humanist um, sort of side of science, and then also kind of the the rigorous side of fiction. Um, that was something that was very attractive about some of the short stories we read as well, and uh, about Stanislav Lem's work in general too. Um, okay. Uh, I think we should actually wrap up now. I know that it was a little bit of a short session because we had to start late, but um, we did say we would end at 2.30, and I want to make sure that everyone can move to their next engagements. Um, I wanted to say, I mean, maybe we could go around and talk about open questions for us about whether, I mean, that could be, you know, I'll start. Open questions for us relating to socialist sci-fi. I'll start with my question, which is, is socialist sci-fi a useful term. <laughs> and it's still not really answered. Yeah. 
I guess the other question would be, what does one discover in socialist sci-fi that one doesn't discover in the same time at American sci-fi? What, what, what aspect of reality does that particular experience open that is, uh, that is absent, that, that, that is not available to Americans? Because it certainly is a unique experience, what people went through in the Soviet Union for about 40 years before they were writing. Uh, and I can't put my finger on it, but definitely with Lem and Strugatsky, one gets a, a, a totally different perspective. Um, for one thing, I mean, a, a very simple uh, notion is that in, America, in American culture, uh, one talks about anti-intellectualism. So in a certain sense where science fiction grows up out of the hard-boiled magazines and so forth, uh, you know, science is introduced because that's okay, but certainly there isn't any kind of intellectual or cultural speculation to the degree. But, but, but when you look at both Lem and Strugatsky, neither of them are uncomfortable with the idea of being intellectuals as they write it. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that they're, they're starting to write intellectual fiction, but that, that dimension of life is just part of what they're doing, and they're speculating on the, the universe. I say, I say even philosophical speculation, so... Um, my interest would be, I mean, for example, I'm uh, one of the authors. I'm what I'm working about is um, Pynchon, and um, Pynchon, one of the writers who uses all kinds of fantastic and science elements of all kinds of, of other genres, among them fantasy and science fiction and so on, in a more realist framework. I mean, at least in the last novels. Uh, I'm talking about Against the Day, for example. I'm not talking about Gravity's Rainbow or the early ones. Um, so what my interest would be, what can we find of this in not clearly science fiction novels um, or also in other artworks that are not clearly um, labeled as sci-fi um, that is maybe... How perverse, pervasive is that, what we find in sci-fi? outside of it. And the second question would be how, maybe you talked about this in the first uh, um, session where I couldn't be present, um, what happens in post-Cold War sci-fi, I mean in relation to that um, dichotomy of American fiction or, or like Western sci-fi and uh, socialist sci-fi. That is surely a very original and interesting question or a constellation to look at. I think Jason's a little bit MIA right now. Was somebody asking me a question? Oh, uh, yeah, Jason, I was just saying, if you want, you could, I, I don't know if you're, how available you are, but we're just going around and saying un unanswered questions, sort of open questions about social sci-fi, something to close with. I guess, I guess for me, one of the big uh, <clears throat> kind of open questions is, um, I mean, conceptually, the idea of uh, social science fiction versus, sci versus science fiction from socialist states, to me, is somewhat diff a different question. Like, it's two different questions, in a way. Um, and so when conceptualizing uh, a reading group like this or, or, or what the fundamental question is, I guess, to some extent, I'm, I mean, I was kind of surprised to find uh, a number of people who I had assumed were were um, probably kind of more libertarian, market-oriented, uh, uh, sort of pro-progress, uh, pro-technology um, science fiction writers from the U.S. and the U.K. <clears throat> uh, when I looked more into their backgrounds, I found out that they that many of them were at least uh, at some point were were socialists, um, and I guess that makes sense given scientific socialism and um, things like that, but. Uh, I guess when we're thinking of what socialist science fiction is, to me, if, if I were, say, editing a book on this question, I would want to think about, uh, I would probably have a lot of different sections of the book. Like, I would have a section about socialist science fiction from non-socialist states, socialist science fiction from socialist states, uh, and then I would be thinking also about how, how was socialism itself um, disrupted by the failure to achieve world socialism 
um, and and therefore to therefore to you know be broken off into lots of different small parts and uneven levels of development and therefore uneven le levels of communication uh, and and uh, um, and sort of common feeling or common project between different countries. Uh, to me, all of that would be would be some central questions that I would be looking at. Ted? Yeah, similarly, I'm, uh, I'm sort of left wondering what the definition of socialism would be in this context. I'm also interested in what, um, which pieces of literature or film are surfacing now as uh, due to interest. That's all. Not to get into generic boundaries, too, but one wonders uh, the relation between uh, uh, Soviet, between the idea of science fiction and just sort of uh, extreme fabulation, of which maybe Pynchon would be one model, but also someone like uh, Platonov in Russia, uh, where they, uh, or or even let's say uh, Bulgakov or something, where one one stretches the laws of reality to, uh, to write, um, so. Um, just so you know, also, I will be working on, um, I, or this is the plan right now, to work on a kind of primer about what it means to, or on the speculative proposition to make socialist art in a capitalist context, what that looks like, what that feels like, um, and it's kind of, it's a little bit, it's, as Nick Land put something else, it's um, open to endless degrees of ironization without loss of information. Um, so it's the same as whether you treat it ironically or not, it's the same question. Um, and I'll be working on a kind of a primer about that that collects a few texts and maybe we'll have, a, I think, a, a section about socialist sci-fi that'll be part of the overall exhibition that this reading group is part of, really, socialism. That's the exhibition that I curated. And so that might come out in January or February. So I might call on you, since you've expressed interest, to maybe think about how we could, you know, move forward on these questions. I don't know whether that would be editing something or doing a translation that hasn't been done or, like, uh, putting together some propositions. But, um, you know, I'll let you know about that as I get news on it. I guess one, one more question that I would have is, um, so I, I brought up the spatial frame. Uh, one more question would be a temporal frame, you know, kind of going back to, I mean, when does science fiction actually begin? Uh, you know, is there such a thing as ancient science fiction um, as well, perhaps? Uh, you know, that would be another question. But then another question would be medium, um, uh, writing versus you know, or sorry, literature versus uh, versus film, uh, and then potentially other genres as well, including music. Um, recently, there's been quite a few um, albums that have come out, and, and of course, in the past, there are others as well uh, within music that, that are that are arguably musical science fiction. Um, and uh, so, so the question of medium, genre, uh, and all of that would would be another one that I would want to think about. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining. The few, the proud. Um, and uh, I'll let you know. At, yeah, I'll let you know about how this project develops. Um, thanks so much for supporting us in terms of building the syllabus out and giving it a trial run. Um, and let's. I'll stay in touch. I'm curious about how your work develops. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. This was great. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.